அனைவருக்கும் வணக்கம் டியர் இமிடியட் பாஸ்ட் பிரசிடென்ட் டாக்டர் மோகன் ராஜன் பிரசிடென்ட் எலெக்ட் டாக்டர் நிர்மல் வைஸ் பிரசிடென்ட் டாக்டர் அருண்மொழிவர்மன் செக்ரட்டரி டாக்டர் சிவராம் கோபால் ட்ரெசரர் பாலாஜி ஏர் சேர்மன் டாக்டர் அத்திக் அண்ட் எடிட்டர் ஜேனல் டாக்டர் ஜெயந்தன் அண்ட் மை டியர் டீச்சர் டாக்டர் விஜயலட்சுமி மேடம் அண்ட் அதர் மெம்பர்ஸ் ஆஃப் தி மேனேஜிங் கமிட்டி டியர் கொலீக்ஸ் பேனலிஸ்ட் அண்ட் மாடரேட்டர்ஸ் அண்ட் டெலிகேட்ஸ் A very warm good evening to all of you. On behalf of myself and uh, the members of the uh, Organizing Club, the Managing Committee of Tamil Nadu Optalmic Association, I extend a warm welcome to all of you for this uh, first uh, webinar of this current year 2022-23. And also, I'm very happy that uh, uh, I have a very uh, young, energetic uh, team of hobbies bearers. I'm really, I'm very lucky to have all of them. And, uh, especially, I'm very happy to uh, introduce my uh, team. Uh, most of you know, but still those who don't know, I want to introduce uh, my uh, president-elect, Dr. Nirmal, again, a uh, very active person in IMA, and also the uh, vice president, none other than Dr. Arunmuli Varman and uh, Secretary Sridharam Gobal from Trichy and the Treasurer Dr. Balaji and the Atik AIC Chairman and uh, Jayendran uh, Editor General. In addition, we have several Managing Committee uh, members. Of course, the theme for the current year uh, is uh, Synergy Through Unity and uh, it is uh, Together we can. The TNY, all of you know very well, is one of the uh, biggest associations in our country with more than 3,000 uh, members in uh, uh, our association. And of course, we have a very uh, major uh, eye care institution in our uh, country, uh, especially South India. Uh, more of uh, uh, this one, all of you know very well. In addition, we have a major eye care institution by the government. and definitely with the cooperation of all of the uh, institution and uh, 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 do the members definitely we can take our association to the higher height it is uh, my duty to thank the uh, and also uh, to uh, congratulate the previous not the previous our senior avis bearers uh, the president the immediate past president dr mohan rajan secretary dr madhavan and uh, dr loganath and treasurer and uh, rajeshwar as yes, chairman and also the charmila editor uh, journal and other uh, managing committee members for their wonderful uh, activities in the last year uh, especially uh, special mention to dr mohan rajan of course i cannot uh, uh, stop myself uh, thanking uh, dr mohan rajan who has uh, done a wonderful uh, work in the last one year not even he left one week every week he had uh, he has uh, uh, almost uh, overdosed uh, <laughs> with uh, so much of hospital week knowledge in this uh, one year. i'm very very happy and uh, thank you dr uh, mohan rajan and also our team also is uh, plan to do something uh, 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 differently not differently something which is uh, very useful for all of the people those who are in the field of ophthalmology in addition we want to uh, extend the uh, this yes the activities to all the two uh, tier cities across the state and also in addition we want to strengthen the district of the village so far only few district or uh, uh, the district of the village uh, association is doing very well but is our responsibility to involve all the people across the state because now the districts are more even five or six members we have to bring them together to uh, strengthen our association so that we can do much more uh, 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 
better uh, performance the, in our career. And also today, I'm really, uh, uh, of course, I'm really very happy uh, to inaugurate the first, uh, start the first uh, uh, program of uh, this current year 2022-23. Uh, today program, I purposely, I wanted to have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, our P. Vijayalakshmi Madam, uh, not only because she was my teacher, but she was uh, having so much of wealth of knowledge that I have never seen other people. And uh, of course, I cannot forget my first day of my posting in 1982, I think it's in April 2nd or something. I joined uh, Devo. The first day I was uh, uh, posted near uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi. The first two questions he asked me was, what are all the refractors? Still, I remember I bluffed like anything because I don't know. I, because I came from a general practice. You no, know? I was doing general practice for two years. And then she asked, then I, uh, then she explained what, what these are all the refractors. That I cannot uh, forget. And of course, Dr. Vijayalakshmi Vadam is uh, one of the few uh, Not audible, Ramakrishnan. There's so many yes. uh, people, of course, most of the, more than 70% of the pediatric ophthalmology in our country may be trained by her only. And also, not only here, and also across the uh, world, and, uh, of course, even the, all the panelists here are her students. Um, and also, she was very much involved in so much of research and other uh, publications. More than that, she is very, very simple, humble, and easily approachable. That's uh, one thing that uh, nobody can uh, have. So we are really honored to have uh, you, Madam, for this uh, First webinar, I immediately told her, Madam, you know, first webinar again. So she was happily uh, accepted my request. Uh, and also, the topic chosen also is very, very, one of the, it may look simple, uh, but this is the bread and butter for most of the ophthalmology. Because uh, the knowledge will definitely will help most of us to improve our. Uh, day-to-day uh, -day practice and also to for the better uh, treatment for our uh, patients. And uh, we have a galaxy of panelists, again, uh, Dr. Meenakshi, Dr. Veena, Meena Kumari, Kalpana, Ram Prakash, all the people are uh, very well-known uh, pediatric ophthalmologists. And of course, Sagitya from Madurai, she is very much involved in low vision surgery, uh, 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 case. And also, she is also going to give a nice talk. It's a different talk on this factor for refractive errors and the environmental modification, which is very much essential nowadays because nowadays, post COVID era, we are having so much of uh, the booming of the refractive errors, especially uh, myopia and uh, etc. Definitely, uh, this webinar will be a very, a very useful. Uh, webinar and uh, of course I'm really uh, happy and uh, definitely uh, everybody will enjoy this webinar and also in addition we have our uh, scientific uh, uh, team our uh, uh, TNOA team has organized one uh, webinar in association in, uh, with the, uh, the uh, national 37th national eye donation portrait that's eye donation so we have a uh, webinar on uh, 3rd of September, uh, that is between 3.30 to uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, most of the leading uh, cardiac people and those who are involved in eye bank activities are more than four decades are all participating. Definitely, again, that will be a very good uh, uh, knowledge sharing. And of course, the first year's activity also we are going to have in Willu this coming Sunday, 28th. So with these, I am uh, just to hand over the, uh, this thing to the moderator, Dr. Ratik and uh, Dr. Meenakshi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful uh, introduction. 
it's a privilege and uh, honor uh, to have this esteemed uh, panel uh, i first i'd like to uh, thank everyone for uh, coming uh, here uh, to begin with i'd like to introduce uh, our moderator uh, for the day uh, meenakshi madam uh, ma'am is a chief pediatric ophthalmologist and strabismologist at arvind eye hospital tirunelveli she is known for her uh, prolific cataract and uh, refractive uh, surgery uh, uh, she was the chairman scientific uh, committee of uh, tnoa twice uh, welcome madam uh, she is uh, well known for her uh, uh, trial on congenital rubella cataract uh, study and she was a co-investigator in steroids for corneal ulcer uh, trial she has numerous publications uh, to her uh, name uh, i would like to uh, next i would like to introduce uh, our panelists for the day uh, to begin with uh, kalpana madam uh, we all know her uh, she is uh, uh, a chief pediatric ophthalmologist and strabismologist she is head of cataract as well as uh, the pediatric ophthalmology department at arvind eye hospital uh, coimbatore she has presented in various national and international conferences uh, she is won uh, n number of awards Uh, one award uh, of significance here which i would like to say is uh, she in 2019 tnoa annual conference madam won the dr ss badrinath soasn alumni medal during the 2019 conference held at uh, salem uh, welcome ma'am it's a privilege to have you on board uh, next i would like to uh, introduce uh, veena madam ma'am is head of uh, cataract and pediatric ophthalmology and strabismology at arvind eye hospital puducherry for the past 20 years she is also a high volume uh, cataract uh, surgeon uh, she is uh, given talks in many states and uh, national conferences and she has uh, numerous publications to her uh, name uh, i would like to introduce dr ram prakash who worked with us and uh, he was uh, he did his dnb here at arvind general delhi and then he did his fellowship at uh, uh, sn chennai and uh, he is a very actively involved in uh, uh, myopia lot of talks he is given on myopia so he is an act, apt person to be in this uh, uh, webinar uh, thank you dr ram prakash for joining us today and uh, you, dr meena kumari is once again uh, one of our uh, alumni and uh, madam's uh, uh, student and uh, they are based at trichy and uh, she has done fellowship in uh, laser retina uh, in lvp and she has also uh, passed the icvo and uh, she is also doing lot of uh, pediatric practice along with her husband dr ramesh welcome uh, dr meena kumari we are glad that we are having you with us and dr sahitya and dr sahitya is a consultant at uh, pediatric ophthalmology and uh, strabismus and she is heading the vision rehabilitation services at uh, madurai and she is doing a lot of work with uh, children with autism spectrum disorders and she has developed protocol for that also and uh, she is very instrumental in developing the vikas uh, app for uh, children with cvi and uh, she is the key person for uh, uh, initiating online vision therapy uh, for children with multiple disabilities during the pandemic during the pandemic it was so difficult and uh, uh, for them to bring the ch children and lot of uh, lacune was there and she brought this online thing uh thank you sahitya for joining us today and delivering the talk we are uh, eagerly awaiting your uh, talk and uh, uh biji madam i think uh, sir uh, dr atik can introduce once again uh, thank you madam uh, well the most difficult part of the webinar uh, was uh, getting madam's uh, profile into slides it ran into multiple uh, pages and uh, to finish reading it uh, was no, like you can uh, start even you can just take the picture thank you madam so uh, uh, actually it was uh, very interesting and innovate uh, uh, to watch uh, to go through madam's profile she is a head of uh, cat, uh, pediatric ophthalmology at Mar uh, madurai arvind eye hospital she was uh, uh, it was uh, nice to know that ma'am was the first pediatric ophthalmologist in india so uh, that's really an honor uh, to have ma'am on on board and uh, with the help of orbis she screened around 4 lakh children in 3 years time which again is a great uh, achievement and uh, she's done a lot of work on uh, rubella cataract and uh, her work has led to reduction in occurrence of rub uh, preventing uh, rubella cataract 
And uh, another great thing which has happened was uh, in Taylor and Hoyt's pediatric ophthalmology textbook, Ma'am is quoted as one of the pioneers in pediatric ophthalmology. She has huge number of publications to her uh, credit. And these are uh, uh, among the few awards that Ma'am has uh, received. Thank you uh, so much, Ma'am, for uh, being with us. So uh, I request uh, Madam to kindly take over. Ma'am is going to talk on spectacle prescription with uh, useful tips on frames and lenses. Thank you so much, ma'am. Privileged to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, the whole uh, team, uh, presidents, present president and the past presidents and all the members, because I don't want to take time now. So we'll uh, start the talk, which I will, uh, I think I will take 45 minutes to 50 minutes for me to finish. Hopefully I try to finish even a little earlier. Let me see uh, how it goes. First slide. I would like to say that is I have no uh, financial interest in this presentation because it talks about so much lenses and uh, frames. I definitely, uh, I don't have any financial interest in this. So coming straight to the uh, subject, giving prescriptions, uh, I can say is an art combined with science. And uh, it's, it's a very easy way to correct all kinds of refractive errors either single vision or when you, are, you need a near vision uh, correction. And uh, apart from your contact lenses, this is a very easy way. And decision making on the numbers is not that difficult once you know a correct retinoscopy. But a holistic approach, that means giving a patient a prescription with an advice on a lens to be used and a frame to be used, and the type of the lenses, there are so much to offer uh, to uh, get their uh, needs uh, met or to get their symptoms relieved. So let us see how to go about this with this. So with this, what are the expected goals all of us have? Usually, most of us concentrate on the first goal, that is improving the visual acuity. How many lines improvement is there? but that is not the only goal that we should have. It should also involve on the functional difficulties, not on the visual acuity per se. Example, a patient with cataract will show an improvement in uh, visual acuity, two, three lines, but they will definitely have a contrast uh, problem or a glare problem. So how do we relieve or know about their problems? and how to relieve their symptoms, including the asthenopic symptoms where the children and young adults come to us. And in children, when they come to sebismus, is there any alteration in our prescription should be made? So in general, how to meet their all visual demands? For that, we should know the demands from them. Also keep in mind in people where we should think about a protective glasses or where we should think about a cosmetic appearances. So it is not exaggeration, as I said earlier, it is an art, not only the science, but it is an art here. So if you start enjoying it, you will enjoy giving advice on all these aspects. So what is the prerequisite? The major prerequisite is getting a good refraction value. And this can be done by your own a preferable technique, whatever way that you have been used to do it. Though cycloplegic refraction is not in necessary in most of the situations, but definitely this can add a value when you see children less than 15 years coming to you for the first time or going to get the prescription for the first time or children or young adults or even elder patients with asthenopic symptoms when they come to you or when the visual acuity is not consistent with your manifest refraction or when there is a variable and inconsistent endpoint of refraction values, suspected accommodative anomalies, or in any age where there is uncooperation and patients are not non-verbal. And in case, all cases of anisometropias and amblyopias. 
these people at least should have a cycloplegic refraction once at least for the first time i don't have to go into the details on this all of you know about the preferable practice of what drugs to be used at what age for to get a, a good cycloplegia so once you do that what should what should you get the details what should you know from the refraction value you should be able to guide though you have assistance in getting the refraction done for, done for you but you should be able to gauge how the values how much reliable or what are the modifications that you have to do for that the first thing is the retinoscopy value should correlate well with the subjective value you should check for it and the uncorrected visual acuity should be compared with the amount of refractive error and then if there is astenopic symptoms make sure that fogging test is done to reveal reveal their manifest hypermetropia if there cylindrical power and axis are there make sure whether it is in coordination with the k reading or your cylindrical uh, corrections exactly your uh, the jackson cylinder corrections in anisometropia what is the patient's need is the patient need spectacle or contact lenses whether you have done binocular testing done and also the binocular balancing before you give the prescription which we will talk little later in detail and usually in general a higher emetropic eye or an astigmatic eye or eye with astigmatism at off axis should be the eye with reduced vision if you see any variations in this that tells you that you should not hesitate to a recheck refraction or even dilate and then get the refraction done so what should you do when the patient comes for a, a review or a follow up visit in the follow up visit first thing you should know about the present discomfort from them and then check for the jump in the power and then compare the jump in the power to the improvement in the visual acuity in snellen or in lines of acuity if it is presbyopia note the jump in power whether it is distance or near and the near vision add has been done according to the jump in the distance power if there is too much jump make sure that axial length measurements are done especially in myopic children if there is a change in the axis it should be checked supposing 95 going to uh, 135 there is something wrong so you should check or compare with the jackson cylinder or k reading and check for the improvement in anisometropia again every time when they come check for the binocular potential and then do the binocular balancing test before you give the uh, correction to the patients so coming to exact prescriptions what are the considerations that you should have in mind see different age groups needs a different uh, prescriptions that depends on infants children adults or elderly whom we are dealing with or are we dealing with a single vision spectacle or are we focused to or are we intended to add a near vision reading what type of a person we are dealing so for that you select the suitable lenses a separate spectacles for near and distance or bifocal if it is bifocals if it is near vision add is it bifocals or progressive lenses or is anything depending upon their glare or uh, photophobias are there any special considerations to be made for them or any special instructions you have to give depending upon the suitable frames let us see one by one when you come to the age we all know that infants and children are hypermetropic since their eyes are smaller by birth this hypermetropia usually by age 7 to 8 years becomes normal or they become emetropic and after that usually they remain till the age of 50 years and that is the time they might develop some or most of us develop uh, astigmatism and hypermetropia you will know if they become presbyopic and this goes nullified or gets better when you develop lenticular myopia this is a normal events but what is this occurrence of refractive errors that happen usually these two second phases the refractive errors occur very commonly in children so during as we say 
from at birth till that hematropia, that is during the process of hematropization, theoretically, if you give full correction, that prevents hematropization. So you give to that in that age, try to give a partial correction to promote hematropization. Full correction can be given once the development is complete or the child is visually mature. But if there is associated strabismus, then it is very different. Supposing a child has got isotropia with hypermetropic error, you have to give a full correction, hypermetropic correction to correct the deviation. In case of exotropia, a myopia, you have to give a full correction so that the myopia can stimulate the convergence so that intermittent exotropias or exophorias can get better. Here, developing or getting a binocular vision under stereopsis is much more important than giving importance to the hematropization. So that takes an upper hand in treating children with, if it is refractive error associated with strabismus is seen. So in general, the guidelines given for correcting myopia in very young children is 3.5 diopters in infants, 1.5 diopters in preschoolers. That means when they have difficulty in looking at the blackboard details, you should give it. And in school boys is 0.75. That, but this may not be a hard and fast rule. Sometimes children with ROP or cerebral vision impairments or with strabismus, you have to deviate from this. Or in a children, a school age children, even the 0.5 diopters, but they definitely have symptoms of blackboard viewing, then you have to give exact correction. So this has to be individualized when you talk to, when you consider children. So what about in general for adults? Adults, they, are, they reach uh, the regular axial length, so usually up to six diopters, exact correction should be given. Do not overcorrect these people. If you overcorrect them, they will have difficulty for near. But in concentrated death, if it is high myopia of any age, full correction rarely be tolerated. You have to balance it for their near vision also, then give correction. Elderly adults usually they feel much better if you give a little under correction. It says one to three diopters, but it can be individualized depending upon the age and the amount of refractive error, what they are wearing, wearing it. But at this age, you have to make sure they are comfortable for their reading. In other uh, situations, a correction with which the patient is comfortable, both for near and distance should be prescribed for anywhere uh, uh, adults, you have to be give importance to the comforts and the needs of the patients. And uh, other uh, uh, things, let us see. When you come to the types of lenses, you may, all, most of you uh, might know that there is uh, lenses, different lenses depend upon the refractive power of their index power. That is what we call as a refractive index. It, it uh, uh, is usually ranges from 1.5 to 1.69. The normal standard lens is called CR39, which is very prevalently prescribed, which has got all basic qualities, even UV filter, but it's a little bit less, 80% maybe, and it has got a possible surface coating. Its uh, important factor here is, is much cheaper, but the problem is it's thicker and heavy. So in children where the thickness and weight is not a concern, that is less than two or three diopters or up to four diopters, this is an ideal lens for uh, uh, cheaper uh, prescriptions. The next comes a lens called Trivex lenses. This is an alternative for this uh, CR39. In, in its thinness, a lightweight, and it's 100% UV protection. And also the impact resistance almost equals to a polycarbonate lenses. But the problem is here it is very, very costlier than the high index lenses. What is this high index lenses? Because the refractive index is higher, the thickness is reduced. You, say, you can see how the normal regular lens looks like and how the high index lens looks like. Almost more than 50%, it is much less. So this should be the choice for myopia 
after even very young or even after four diopters of lens mm, error, this should be our choice if the patient can afford it. So now coming to frames for myopia, moderate and high myopes, usually preference will be a thick and full rim frame, which can cover the edges of the frame, edges of the lenses. Otherwise, no, the edge will be seen out. It will be cosmetically unacceptable. Very high myopes, preferably a small round frame. Also, a plastic frame can hide the lens edges. The plastic frame, if you have seen, will have a groove in the center that can hide the lens edges. And if you have very thin frame, as you see in the uh, picture, and the lenses will pop out, it will be seen more cosmetically uh, unacceptable, both in front and the back side. So they should be always avoided. So what about the follow-up of myopic patients? That depends upon the amount of the errors, age, associated deviation, amblyopias, et cetera. In non-compliance to spect spectacles, assess the causative factor. This is very important. And try to overcome that non-compliance. If visual acuity is good with the lens power, existing lens power prescription, try not to change the prescription. You can give the new prescription, but try not to change it. If necessary, do a cyclopragic refraction. In moderate to high myopes, the axial length measurements and indirect for more details in the retina is very much essential. Always correlate with the previous findings. And in progressive myopes, consider myopia control measures. What is this myopia progression? Myopia progression, now it is uh, uh, gaining more importance because children are uh, getting uh, increase in this for no exact reasons. Two schools of thoughts are there. One, a cause is peripheral defocus. Two is the accommodation lag. Let us see what is this peripheral defocus. As you see here, the first picture, a normal myopic, uh, myopic child is a uh, myopic error is there. So when you correct with the normal lens, the normal lens focuses the image exactly at the center through the pupil. But in the periphery, the lens, uh, the uh, prescription, it goes like what you see here. I think you have to come. See, in the periphery, the same focus is not in the center, but it goes here. So in the periphery, it's a defocused. That means so the image goes, goes up, goes out of the eye. This is eye, hyperopic defocus is there. So what does it happen because of this hyperopic defocus is, the theoretically it says, this defocus stimulates the growth of the eyeball posteriorly. As you have marked, there's a, a pink mark. What is the enlargement? Eye starts enlarging. So this is the concept of peripheral defocus causing an increase in myopia. And it can be corrected with, by giving a defocus correcting lenses. So how to do it? In the market, these are the available lenses. That is a myovision, myosmart, and stellus, stellus it, a spelling mistake is there. Stellus lens is not I, it's a E. So these three lenses are there in the market right now available. So one should know to how to prescribe and how do we uh, go about it? Because people, patients are very much knowledgeable and then they come to you with the questions. So how does it work? The central zone, as you see, that ensures a undisturbed foveal vision by providing stable power for the distance. At the same time, the peripheral region, because we said there is a hyperopic defocus, this peripheral uh, region has got annular rings of hyperopic power. It increases in steps from pupillary area to the periphery in steps. So that takes care of the peripheral defocus by getting the rays focused exactly in the uh, inside the retina. Let us see in this video how that happens. It's the next generation of myopia management single vision lenses, Zeiss MyoVision Pro. MyoVision Pro is a single vision lens with specific myopia management design. 
the periphery of the lens is responsible for myopia control whereas the central zone provides a sharp vision correcting myopia. With standard single vision lenses, the central zone works fine, but the periphery of the lens often projects the image behind the visual area. This can result in a signal to the eye to elongate, which increases the progression of myopia. So the Zeiss MyoVision Pro Lenses active zone in the periphery corrects this defocus and in consequence can help reducing myopia progression. Same way, there is a, uh, this other uh, lens has got multiple lenses, you see. These lenses are almost nine rows. They are placed differently uh, in so many, uh, in uh, highest uh, plus powers and that takes care of the defocus, whatever it's created. What is it? Accommodative lag causing uh, the effect on the axial length elongation. As you see here, there is a, we know there's a hyperopic shift due to insufficient accommodation response. That is accommodation lag or accommodation insufficiency. So this is, the lenses are specifically adapted to the needs of the children. Here, the progressive lenses will be much more beneficial than our defocus lenses in this situation when there is an accommodation lag. So these progress lenses are not like exactly what you see for adults. And here the, the uh, factors are there's a short corridor to make near vision zone easily accessible, a broad near vision uh, zone and uh, less uh, peripheral zone. So with that, there will be high visual acuity within this progression zone. And also there is a large, clear, far zone, as you see uh, for far distance, unlike in uh, adults progressive lenses. So this is specially designed lenses available for children for um, control of myopia. And there is one more research. This person uh, uh, performed, uh, before that, maybe let us see, which one that we choose, whether where do uh, how to go about choosing a Paul lens or a peripheral defocus lens. Always in these children with the correction, perform a cover test, binocular functions, including accommodation amplitude measurements. If there is esophoria with accommodative lag, try to give a Paul lenses. If there is orthophoria or exophoria with almost normal accommodation, I give a defocus lenses. Age group, recommended age group is 6 to 12 years, can try up to 16 years. The available powers are up to 9.5 diopters and the cylinders up to 4 diopters with a spherical equivalent of 9.5 in total. So like uh, what we uh, prescribe in four years with the glasses, we do prescribe prisms, you know, the same thing you can do with your uh, this defocus lenses also. That's the one more advantage of uh, giving a defocus lenses. There is another lens is recommended that is a violet light uh, lenses. He observed that the violet light emitting spectacle frames significantly suppress the axial length elongation eight to 10 years old. So he, uh, the Jiang hypothesis that lack of violet light in the environment itself may be a factor causing a surge in the myopia in modern societies. So he prefers or he recommends usage of uh, lens, uh, violet uh, lenses, violet lens light emitting lenses. So now coming to hypermetropia. As again, in children, the common guidelines is partial correction in infants and young children, but Indications for this partial correction is in moderate to high degrees, degree hypermetropias, amount required just to improve your visual acuity, especially when they are asymptomatic or when there is no uh, eye strain at all. This holds good. And in presence of exo deviations and hypermetropia, try to go a little bit uh, less correction. But when do you go with the full correction? In presence, presence of ESO deviations, we, what happens is uncorrected hypermetropia 
the child exerts too much accommodation to see clear for near. In that attempt, accommodative convergence increases, causing accommodative esotropia. So in these cases, if the accommodative convergence per accommodation takes place normally, then you try to give a single vision, the ESO deviation will get completely uh, corrected. So as you see in this picture, completely corrected. Sometimes when accommodation get, fails to get relaxed in these children, try to give a short time cycloplegics, they will get, uh, they accept the glasses very well. Here, we are talking about emetropization earlier. The interference with emetropization is outweighed here in presence of uh, uh, ESO deviation here. So you don't have to think about emetropization, but you have to think about gaining a binocularity or retaining a binocularity. So in cases where there is high AC by A ratio, you need to think about correcting deviation both for distance and the residual deviation. The deviation for distance will get your retinoscopy value, whatever cyclopragic value you get, that will get corrected. But for near, might need a little bit more addition for near. But how do we give it? This should be given like executive bifocals where the upper segment, upper edge of the lower segment should bisect the center of the pupil. So you have to explain to the parents why exactly you need to be. So when you give prescriptions, you try to concentrate on a frame to be suggested because it should be a round frame like this. It will be larger frame and then power should be prescribed. Also indicate executive bifocals and also state that it is for accommodative isotropia for children. Then the optician will dispense accordingly. So like here, what you see, the distance segment corrects isotropia for distance till there is a, a residual isotropia for near. So this is not a correct way for him to wear, though it's bifocal. But now when you pull or push the uh, frame little bit above, it corrects for near also. This is the correct way. But what should happen is this area where the frame is not holding on the uh, nose because the nose is very thin. So this knee is an extra nose pad here. So that you should concentrate when you give prescriptions. In here, as you see, the nose pads here snugly fits on the uh, nose. So the lens will not come down. Normal lens is coming down, no problem. But bifocal lenses coming down will be a problem that you should concentrate on giving the lenses correctly. So what about hypermetropia in adults? Adults, when they come with asthenopia, even a small degree of hypermetropia should be uh, corrected. This is what you get eye strain and there will be a focusing problem. But the amount of correction should be just to relieve the asthenopic symptoms. If you overcorrect it, they will end up with early presbyopia at the age of 30, 35. So you just give exact correction to relieve the asthenopic symptoms. Do not overcorrect it. So, but here you should be able to differentiate it from a pure account convergence insufficiency from a pseudo convergence insufficiency because of accommodative error. Because both of them need a different treatment. Accommodation problem needs spectacles. Convergence problem need exercises or prisms. So what you do, you just with the correction, measure the near point of convergence and near point of accommodation. If both are reduced, Repeat the measurements with small amount of plus lenses, whatever plus 0.75 or plus one. If NPC and NPA improves, confirm your diagnosis as pseudo convergence insufficiency because of accommodation lag, and then give these children the correction, they will definitely re will be relieved from their asthenopic symptoms. So when we talk about headaches, can a spectacle alone can cause headache? Definitely, yes. We have seen. So many patients coming with uh, headaches, and then you see prescription power, everything is correct, but it could be one thing, incorrect prescription, but when that is correct, it could be due to decentration of the spectacle lenses, or could be due to misalignment of the simple misalignment. If you just know and correct it on site, they'll be too, so happy to it. These are the few things I think all of us should be aware. We don't, should not leave these small things to the optician to check and then correct it. So what is the follow-up? In children, 
slow weight when they are given bifocal the near vision ads should be weaned very slowly and then the distant vision glasses so many of them sometimes retain the distance power can suggest contact lenses if they still retain their near vision ad also but young adults spectacles should be continued till their asthenic symptoms are relieved what are the small amount is necessary over corrections avoid over corrections as i said earlier because of is causing undue relaxation of accommodation so coming to astigmatism most babies and infants exhibit at least small degree of astigmatism but usually that that gets resolved by 3 years of age hence a first 3 years you don't worry about giving astigmatic correction less than 2 diopters are if there is more than that then you try to give at least a partial uh, correction in oblique axis if it is oblique axis even 1.5 or 1 or uh, 1.5 or 2 that should be given at any age older children and adults acceptance clarity and comfort should be given how do we monitor you monitor this uh, uh, cylindrical powers change in the axis compare with the k reading every time when they come now with the pandemic after the pandemic we have seen even a 7 8 year old getting a uh, keratoconus so we should be aware of this early development of keratoconus and get op scan done if needed and then do uh, a correct management so what about anisometropia now in general anisometropia is well tolerated by infants and toddlers even sometimes unilateral uh, high myopes or even high hypermetropes they tolerate very well even up to unilateral uh, aphakias there is a report saying that they tolerate very well correcting unilateral aphakias in a infant and usually myopias are better tolerated than hypermetropias small anisometropias usually associated with eccentric fixation a small parafoveal or perifoveal or microtropia fair fusion is there usually there will be abnormal correspondence but with the fusion so you give full correction in this place but there is a higher anisometropia what are the factors here is in anisometropia anisoconia is the problem anisoconia devolution is the problem usually up to four diopters they can tolerate that is 5% magnification and each one uh, two is causing two degree magnification here so if still the patient opts for the spectacles only not the contact lenses what you have to do is under correct the more astig more uh, anisometropic eye in steps till there is no double vision that is called binocular balancing and then give the prescription without give, uh, doing that never give prescriptions because in the clinic they may not a complaint to you about diplopia but when they wear it definitely they'll uh, complain of diplopia and come back to you in the next day with the double vision so binocular vision checking and binocular balancing is very important before prescribing correction for anisometropias if patient is got a concern for visual acuity improvement suggest them contact lenses with full correction that is the best option but the importance here is all should have binocular functions evaluated even young adults more than binocular function evaluation even older adults young adults or older adults what i mean is up to 18 or 20 years if they have not had treatment so far for amblyopia or hypermetropia management suggest review in your orthopedic department so that sometimes they might improve with your amblyopia management so now coming to presbyopia what is it how do we prescribe near vision ads here again depends upon the age occupation and the visual demands and then consider distance correction and then type of error for distance and then check for amplitude of accommodation associated ocular diseases again here avoid over correction because they should be very comfortable for reading and then decide about the lenses what lenses exactly that you want so when you give a cryptoc usually there will be a jumping effect earlier when we were students these were the lenses which was available cryptoc lenses usually we tick tick the cryptoc but now better optics have come this is not being practiced by many of us now but what about this d bifocal or your uh, uh, see you can see small d here segment height for k bifocal is the 
distance from the lower limbal border to the deepest point of the lens to the rim of the frame. So make sure this is our at least 14 millimeters and this is at least 10 millimeters. So unless you have that, the patient will have difficulty. So you should be able to suggest the frame or you should be able to check uh, the, the uh, trouble when they come to you with the uh, problems. So this is what exactly you have to do it for. Executive bifocals when you prescribe, usually now uh, not many of us are prescribed in this after the fall lenses. But when we have that, it is not like uh, what you see for children. It is a little uh, different in adults. So coming to the progressive addition lenses, there are basic things. Two, three types are available. The uh, progressive additions, it is advantages are clarity for distance, no jumping effect, and cosmetically better. But disadvantages, again, it has got high aberration at periphery. So you have swim effect is there and requires adaptations. When you go over the higher ends, this adaptation time requires much less. So this is what the dis, uh, design, a distance design, a progressive corridor, and near uh, design. So as you go for the higher designs, you have a near vision corridor a better, and also uh, the uh, distance corridor also is good, and then wider uh, uh, the progressive zone. So all this is important when you consider your progressive lenses. There is now it has come a digital progressive lenses where it's a, each lens is customized for each prescription, eliminating distortion and will help in easy transition for far and near. But it's a, not available for high powers and very high powers, but it's still available for moderate to high powers. But uh, the problem here is, is very, very expensive and available powers limited to this powers. So when you consider Paul, you can't prescribe Paul for everybody. It is suitable for all presbyopic patients, those with specific need for intermediate vision, and those who want cosmetic effect. But make sure it is not suitable for uncontrolled diabetes or in weavers or in drivers. When you give drivers also, they will not be able to drive the uh, vehicle comfortably. So when you come to the uh, frame size for uh, frame material size and shape, this is what plastic frames, no adjustable materials is not advisable. But a metal frame with adjustable nose pads is more advisable. And a uh, frame size where there is more near zone and less peripheral zone is recommended for this. Also, the size should be enough where it should be the lower segment, 14 millimeter and 10 millimeter should be there for the distance segment. So if you meet all these ideal things, then the adaptability or the, uh, in the immediate period will be much, much less for that particular patients. So points here for near vision correction is a goldsmith, you have to consider a separate glasses for near. A watch mechanic, again the same. A weaver, executive one will have better peripheral areas. For computer persons, fall lenses, drivers, a bifocal or only a distant vision if there is a distant vision correction is there. And regarding aphakias, in children, if you see here, this aspheric cleanse is so thin, but it comes in a lenticule form. So it will have a gap here, but in three months or a one month baby, when you are a fake two months baby, you can give this till they become 18 months and then give exact correction for distant near vision also. But for initial correction, you just give exact correction what you get the retinoscopy value because the child's interest is only for a near and you can't give a bifocal at that age. And in general, for hypermetropias, avoid frames with small width. As the lens, you just imagine the uh, convex lenses uh, here, and then the edge thickness will be high. So it should not be avoid metal frames, half rim, and also rimless ones frames, so that these lenses are, this frame is a very good suggestible frame for hypermetropias. In pseudo fakes, Pseudo fakes, when you check the details on implanted lenses, because 
they may have usually they have a uh, blue color variable color uh, reflections violet color reflections aware of the glare reflections caused by the lenses correction which correction that you are going to give and check whether usually now iols are all uv filters but check whether there is uv filters are there or not and usually children or young adults they tolerate astigmatism better so don't hesitate to give astigmatic error unless you give them they will not be very uh, comfortable in children initially still they become stable you can give bifocal but later on you can give pro um, progressive lenses which they will enjoy what about in elderly patients elderly patients already there will be existing refractive errors or say maybe they may acquire a small degree of astigmatism as we said earlier acquired errors may be because of lens changes change in the corneal shape and lenticular myopias hypermetropias are more common and uh, disease when you take it a morning myopic shift and increased glare paralleling increased corneal thickness may indicate an advanced peak dystrophy which is quite common in older individuals which unless you see slit lamp you may miss it so you may not uh, rely on the findings what they describe but you should be able to judge their problems and people who have had rd repair vitrectomy with fluid all will show unstable status of their refractive errors so you should wait till the error gets stable and then give prescriptions what about in diabetes diabetes usually the elevated blood glucose levels cause a higher glucose levels in the aqueous humor and then higher sorbitol levels causing tissue swelling so this swelling takes approximately one month for it to regain or uh, regain the original status so when there is a acute uncontrollable diabetes you have to wait at least for a month for you to uh, get a stable refractive error before giving the prescriptions what about in glaucoma glaucoma again acute you know that there will be a myopic shift and there is acute corneal edema they may have a transient glare because of corneal astigmatism and the corneal edema also and then wait till the iop gets controlled and the decreased vision may be also associated with field defects decreased dark adaptation light sensitivity and glare so when we prescribe for glaucoma patients you have to consider get the com complaints from them not only on the visual acuity also find out the other problems from them and try to address by giving a, a right prescription and some special situations let us see special situations in congenital glaucomas usually congenital glaucomas glaucoma specialists will take care of the glaucoma control but most of the time we forget to do the refraction because the enlarged globe usually axial myopia will be prevalent so try to get the error refractive error done and give a correct prescription to to prevent amblyopia occurrence so in spite of your uh, glaucoma control child might go for uh, amblyopia if you don't correct the myopia or the astigmatism which is quite common in here in uh, congenital glaucomas and also the progressive myopia should be each time when the child comes for review there should be uh, check for everything and then what is it now people are uh, most of them coming for eye strain what is it i am doing a computer work for all the day and i get eye strain so what any special lenses can you give me but for this you should have some knowledge on our uv rays and then uv spectrum what we have normally this uv rays are absorbed by the crystalline lens normal human lens if it is iols iols also uh, filter all this uv rays but it is been observed that this blue light displayed on the screen is supposed to uh, uh, induce the sleep problems by suppressing the production of melatonin also when this passes inside the eye it might cause armd there are uh, research papers saying that it might be the cause for armd and it might be the cause for eye strain so just by prescribing a lens with the blue filter there are two things are available blue filter or complete blue cut lenses anything that you want but blue filters may be uh, should be uh, enough so if you could prescribe them they can work happily without getting an eye strain so this is very well accepted and then you should 
I, I, at this time, I think all of us should know. And then how do we address this uh, people coming with a glare or photophobias? Purpose here in prescribing tints is usually earlier we have only photo gray. We just commonly say photo gray. You can use it. So you just explain to them and then give the filter or a dark tint. It is not so. Purpose is to filter the unwanted or harmful radiations from the environment. Just to improve the contrast sensitivity, also to improve the dark adaptation, at the same time, reducing the glare and light sensitivity. So tints can also alter color perception. You should know that, example, an yellow tint when you give, that enhances contrast, but also makes it difficult to differentiate between blue and green colors. But gray would not alter any color perceptions. So hence, each patient needs an individualized trial okay. on uh, uh, prescribing this. spectacles. See, this type uh, girl is an albino. Usually what we expect, we we expect the, uh, her to accept a red tint or uh, uh, Dark of tinted, the three, which one do you she accepts the more, uh, yellow tinted glasses. So this one. all depends upon how again. the light sensitive cells are working in a particular individual. This you are comfortable. Usually you should consider okay. these uh, tinted lenses in albinism, aniridias, RP, cone rod dystrophies, and drivers, and for any uh, cosmetic uh, purposes also. And this glare, this glare, how do we differentiate it? How do we check for the glare? Whenever the patient has glare, you just check for the glare with the tints or the filters in a normal environment. And all of you should know now that uh, uh, normal patients with normal visual acuity also can experience glare apart from patients having a reduced visual acuity. For them, a simple Polaroid lenses also can help. Also, sometimes this filters. What you see for drivers, most of them complain of glare at night. So what is that special coating? This is available in every other optical shop. This is available lenses. You can see this amber colored uh, lenses. This has got a special coating in front. There is a uh, front side, there's a special coating and there is a blue pr uh, protection on the back side. So the illumination night, if the people dilates and that also been taken care of by in this uh, lenses prescribing. So now recently, there's a literature says, there's a special lens called Axon Spectra Shield Lenses. And I don't have much experience with that, but I read in the literature saying that this is for photosensitivity of any kind, a dry eye or spasms or of any kind, especially in patients who get migraine because of sensitivity to light. And those patients, they say this is very well, uh, a very good lens for them to suggest, but it is not available in our region, so I don't have much experience on it. And all the coatings, all of you uh, know that these are the coatings, whatever we have in the thing. Coming to protective spectacles, polycarbonate lenses are advisable for one night. In summary, the ideal spectacle should be well centered within the frame. The frame should be wide enough so that there is just slight clearance between the frame temples and the sides of the head. Usually if you pass like this, it should be enough for you to introduce your um, index finger and then take it out. If that is so, that shows invariably a, a right frame. And then the top of the frame wire should follow the eyebrow line and satisfying the all visual uh, demands of the patients. This is the correct ideal spectacle for anybody. So how do we achieve it? It is now only by choosing a, a right lens and a right frame. A right lens means it should be light and thin, comfortable, break and impact resistance, re reliable scratch resistance, should have anti-reflection coating and UV protection whenever needed. And the frame should be comfortable stable, should not slip away from the nose, should not interfere with the nasal bone formation in children, and then the material should be selected according to the individual patient. Also, one should have knowledge about this UV filters. Is UV filter, these lenses usually observe the human lens. 
is a potentially dangerous, causing retinal damages. So all spectacles, most of them, the lenses and eye oils have UV filters, but you do check. And aphakic pseudophakics without the UV filter lens, and you, they will have a blue or violet colors. So you should take care of them by giving the same filters. And for that reason, uh, most of our ophthalmic instruments have these kind of filters in our day-to-day uh, uh, -day lens. So what are the helpful hints to avoid incorrect prescriptions here? Most of the myopes need just adequate power with the maximum clarity. Do not overcorrect hypermetropias. Do not change the axis of the cylinder, especially in myopes, unless there is a compelling reason, even when they come for a review. Do not prescribe a large cylinder for any patient who has not worn cylinder correction earlier. So more than minus four, if you prescribe it, they will not be comfortable. But pseudo fakes, they do accept it. Do not give too great a reading addition initially and you make sure that they are able to read at their arm's length. And do not recommend bifocals, progressive lenses without considering the needs, occupation and affordability. Also, uh, take care when you, uh, and the next time when they uh, come for it, changing the lenses from single vision to bifocal, bifocal to progressive lenses, you should be, do it, you should uh, do it very carefully. So what are the other things to promote compliance on wearing spectacles? As we said earlier, do not alter a satisfactory prescription unless there is a very definite reason. Don't recommend a minor change in, just because they say it is more clear because it may not be a right way to give prescriptions since they fail to appreciate the improvement subjectively when they go out. And discuss with the patient the practical points relevant to the new prescription when you are changing, especially when you are changing the single vision spectacles into bifocals, bifocals into pole lenses, and their adaptations, etc. Warn a bifocal wearer to be careful about the steps. Specific conditions, suggestions given on selection of frames and lenses also. So in general, listen to their problems patiently. Try to find out a solution as a holistic approach. It is not an exaggeration to say this is definitely an art. It's not only a science. It is an art to give a spectacular prescription satisfying all the aspects of uh, the patient needs. So as I said to uh, justify again, there must also be the joy of doing something beautiful, giving a correct spectacle and then seeing the happiness in their faces is be more satisfying for us, for all ophthalmologists. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I think I kept my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for the wonderful uh, talk. It's really, it's, uh, I don't know how to say. It's, uh, I learned a lot because I don't know much about the description. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but really, it's, uh, I open it for more purpose. Hmm. I open it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Hello. Madam. Uh, uh, madam, just to, uh, uh, yes, madam, Minakshi, madam, please carry on. Uh, uh, like, uh, we'll open it up for discussion. And I want one quick question from madam, answer from madam. Yes. Uh, madam, when do you start uh, giving progressive lenses in pseudofix? Pseudo in adults, uh, whenever. Uh, in children, madam. Children. In children, first you give only uh, bifocal. And do you do executive bifocal or? Six months. Any bifocal should be all right. Even cryptoc you can give. Nothing okay. will happen. Executive not necessary. Okay. But it's very expensive also. Okay. So executive not necessary. Uh, so uh, any bifocal you can give. Usually D bifocal we prefer. And then once three to six months time, age, depending upon age, three to four years, if they're comfortable, then you start giving progressives. A basic progressive itself, they just uh, get very well, Minakshi. Need yes. not go for the digital progressive lenses. Okay.
Uh, madam, one question because uh, this uh, you were talking about myopia control lenses. Any in, uh, any uh, situation where they should not be prescribed, ma'am, myopia which is progressing. Uh, yes. Any condition where it should not be prescribed, ma'am? Well, the contraindications are very young uh, children. See, before five, six years, not uh, you can't prescribe. And the high myopes, where there's retinal pathology, you can't prescribe because we don't know, because it's only re uh, recent uh, development. So uh, you can't. And there is uh, uh, anisometropias, large anisometropias. Those I think we cannot. I think now, with uh, all the available lenses, nobody has got more than a six months experience. So we need to wait and see which lenses are doing what. And then we have to go according to our own experience, what it says. In Sebismus, we say, when you do your surgery, you get your own measurements, like what exactly do uh, better for you. The same thing holds good for uh, here also, with the learning goes now. Madam, would you recommend uh, myopic, moderate myopic children to avoid glasses when they're using near vision? At uh, least at home? Not necessarily. Depends upon the power. See, they want this progressive, uh, uh, what these myopic control lenses, defocus lenses have, they start with slowly defocus from the center to the periphery. From the, in the center, they start with plus 0.5, small additions. They say in the periphery, plus 3. They go up to 3, 3.5 plus addition. So you have seen, uh, remember, no, that picture I showed you about the curve which comes in the periphery. It starts, the curve is a little bit smaller in the paramacular area. And as you go wider, it just gets wider. So that kind of a thing you can't give uh, get in, uh, in your uh, practice. And then uh, wearing glasses one time, taking out another time, that may not be very easy for many people. It will go on different uh, complex, different problems. Okay. Not many will be happy. Uh, Ram Prakash sir and uh, Veena madam, your experience on uh, these uh, myopia controlling lenses, uh, uh, madam and sir, please. And Veena madam. Um, I, I've just started using. So maybe one glass we have given because it is so expensive and difficult to convince the patient to buy it. So we are yet to receive the comments from the patient. Okay. I, I agree with uh, Madam and also like uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi Madam said, it's only recent, like six to 12 months that we have the lens. And uh, as far as uh, I study the myopia, this is a process that happens over many years. So it's not right to judge any method, be it atropine or glasses, just based on a six month follow up. So everybody is in their early days. So we'll have to wait longer time to know whether these lenses are working or not. Also, I think you asked me when not to prescribe. Don't prescribe it at the first time. See, you have to get the amount of the error and then the axial elongation, all the care readings, binocular functions, everything, accommodation, everything ready. Review the patient. Now, right now, the rules must be Review the patient six months, and if it is a regular 0.25 increase, you don't have to worry about it. What do you normally expect the children to increase? But if there is a uh, more increase in the axial length or your uh, refractive power, the next visit, then you can think about prescribing your uh, uh, lenses. I think that I think when there is something available, and you should explain to the parents. And then uh, it's scientific, it's nothing, uh, no complications will result because of this. So it looks, seems to be more scientific. So you should, uh, we should be able to give a chance to the parents and the uh, patients. If I can add to uh, what Madam has said, uh, it has to be used only for patients with uh, axial myopia. So patients with other types of myopia like lenticular myopia and uh, corneal myopia should be avoided. And most of, in fact, all of the studies use only uh, these methods on patients with otherwise normal eye condition. So retinal problems, uh, corneal problems, these should be avoided. Again, if you have a child who is going to break the glasses frequently, these are uh, non-medical indications, who loses his glasses, who has uh, very poor care for the glasses. These are things that you have to weigh in before deciding on these costly lenses. Because 16,000 for six months, or if the child is going to break every three months, it's not a joke for the parents. 
there is a question from uh, uh, one of our participants. It is from Dr. Vidya Lakshmi from Chennai. Uh, one of the patients underwent both eye cataract surgery, came for follow-up, uh, two weeks right eye and one month left eye, uh, complaining of uh, blue vision post-surgery. Uh, uh -huh. Vision is normal. What sort of coating and lens would you prescribe in these patients? Uh, request a quick comment from all the panelists, please. Uh, Veena, madam. Uh, can, can you can you repeat the question, please? Sorry, uh, uh, was some. Uh, Ma'am, uh, post cataract yeah, surgery, post. patient is complaining of uh, blue uh, light. So uh, those patients, what would you like to prescribe? What lens or coating you'd like to prescribe? See, Madam has pointed out earlier uh, to filter that uh, we can advise that blue filter glasses. Uh, which I think Madam has already uh, advised the same. We also do that. But many patients, we come, uh, we get complaints of glare, not the blue tint, which uh, which is which is not a common complaint, at least uh, in my practice. I have uh, many children complaints of glare. So I advise uh, uh, photochromic glasses when they go out or something. But otherwise, uh, I don't get this complaint very often. Usually, I think they just get used to it. This uh, blue, uh, it's very difficult to eliminate it. Only very few are sensitive uh, way to uh, tell us about this blue uh, thing. But usually, this is only in the periphery. And as they get wear glasses, they just eliminate, the brain just eliminates it. There is no direct way of uh, giving any other tint to uh, compensate that blue uh, experiences. Okay. Thank you, madam. Madam, many children are presenting with uh, myopia and esophoria now. Yes. How do we manage that, madam? You have to uh, uh, give, maybe you can give, if this esophoria is symptomatic, you can prescribe prisms. With myopic spectacles, you can add a small, usually will be, esophoria will be very small. If the visual acuity cannot be compromised. If you are uh, by reducing your power, the visual acuity gets reduced. Then you can think about giving prisms. If visual acuity remains the same, even by reducing a, a point by or something, then you should be able to you should be able to reduce it. Uh, ma'am, did ma'am? I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, with all the uh, CFL bulbs and LCD lightings, which are supposed to be uh, emitting emitting lots of blue light. Is it like uh, should we practice uh, uh, lenses with a blue light filter in all the pediatric cases, ma'am? No, no. Exposed to along with this lighting, the computer. Uh. All of us, the same UV spectrum, uh, mm -hmm. whatever in the environment is there in this uh, LED bulb also. Mm -hmm. It is not pretty much exaggeration. Mm -hmm. But when people get eye strain because of this uh, um, UV spectrum, normally uh, in the environment then you have to think about giving a blue blue filters but not for not all of us are photosensitive see but uh, oh, i have a patient uh, i've been telling for photosensitive light sensitive for so many years so, uh, so some people you have to consider that but not everybody is that much photosensitive you don't have to give blue filters for everybody Thank you. At the end of the day, yeah. blue filters might just be a marketing gimmick. Yes, we are yes. talking about children where uh, who are already on glasses and talking about blue filters. Yes. What about the normal children who are exposed to the same light who don't have refractive risk? They are very much leading a normal life. So I think it should be uh, more on a symptom-based approach yes. rather than a blanket step. Also, there are reports now, research says blue filters earlier when it came into the market, and we all started prescribing for all uh, uh, IT persons whenever they come with eye strain. But later on, they said there is uh, no use of these blue filters. But if they subjectively, they feel better. There is nothing that we can measure the nanometers of blue uh, filtering uh, uh, UV spectrums. So subjectively, if they feel better, yes, definitely we can prescribe. There is no harm in prescribing blue filters. But don't prescribe this blue cut. You just give blue filters. Otherwise, no their uh, dark adaptation, other things, other uh, problems might manifest. So just give blue filter, not a blue cut lens. 
Ma'am, uh, one more question for you. Like after uh, the post-COVID uh, time frame, we are facing a very steep increase in the refractive errors, ma'am. In our all our school screening programs, uh, nearly uh, uh, 30% to 40% are having refractive errors, ma'am. What's your uh, opinion on it and uh, what's your observation, ma'am? It is not that high, but I think Sagitya's topic is next thing there. Mm -hmm. Sagitya is going to talk on this, the risk factors and uh, uh, environmental modifications, why we are getting. The next the topic is that. I think she will deal. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Meenakshi, madam. Yeah. Uh, thank you, madam, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, because uh, the lot on frames and everything, which a lot of us uh, don't know about uh, the frames and all that, and that on tins also. So what you told about uh, individualizing each patient is very important in uh, pediatrics and squint. So you are telling even for LVA and everything, it, it has to be customized. So thank you once again for that wonderful talk. And uh, as we are short of time and uh, we have to go on to the next presentation, I now invite Dr. Sahitya uh, for giving her talk on uh, uh, how to modify modifiable risk factors and environmental modifications and risk factors for refractive errors. Over to you, Sahitya. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity today. It's actually an honor to share a session with madam and uh, uh, in, in the presence of such an eminent panel as well. Uh, is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes. Yes, Saitya. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, so coming on to pre-myopia, the risk assessment and lifestyle modifications. Once, um, not once, a very uh, couple of years back, until a couple of years back, myopia was just considered an optical inconvenience. Though we considered it a disease, we always thought it was an optical inconvenience, put glasses and then uh, the issue is done. But today it's become a global uh, epidemic and it's a public health issue. The problem with myopia is that it is multifactorial. There's no one proper reason to say, okay, this is why you're going to have myopia. There are a lot of reasons. And the major issue is that there is no safe level of myopia. As undergrads and as postgrads, we've always read this simple myopia, physiological myopia and pathological myopia. And there's a glorious minus six cutoff. Even to, to see indirect or something, if you see something over minus six, then we uh, the, that alarm bell rings. Otherwise, you're like, Safe, it's okay, it's, it's still simple myopia. But the reality is that there is no safe level of myopia and complications associated with myopia like myopic maculopathy, they are exponential. However, they are non-linear, which means, doesn't mean that the lower level of myopia is going to be associated with lower complication level. You have myopia, you're prone in for a myopic maculopathy. And now in today's uh, scenario, without proper control, almost 50% will be myopic with 10% in the high myopic zone by 2050. So what is this pre-myopia? So far, we've been talking about how to manage and intervene myopia, but now we are go going into primary healthcare as in prevent this thing before it even starts. So the IMI has defined myopia as the refractive state of an eye with less than or equal to plus 0.75 diopters and more than 0.5 diopters in children where there is a combination of other risk factors, say age or other associated risk factors which can push the child into a myopic zone. So in simple words, the child still has a non-myopic refraction, but there are risk factors and the pattern of eye growth indicates that this child might be pushed into a myopic corridor. So what are the risk factors? Now, when we're talking of myopia, there are a whole lot of list of risk factors. Everything is uh, being seen suspiciously uh, saying, will it cause myopia? So of that baseline refractive error or your cycloplegic spherical equivalent and your ocular biometry, the axial length of the eye, these are major risk factors which contribute to myopic progression. Apart from it, we have genetic female gender, outdoor time, near work, accommodation, age at onset, ethnicity, education, etc., which are all factors being told for uh, myopic onset as well as progression. So when we come to cycloplegic refraction, this is the single most significant risk factor. 
this particular risk factor is independent of family history or visual uh, environment or anything uh, any other risk factor need not be along with it only this spherical equivalent if is it in the if it is in the premyopic zone this is a very significant risk factor and this is the most important as well so this table says from 6 years of age if you see a, a spherical equivalent that is a refractive state of the eye if it is less than or equal to plus 0.75 diopters then this child is a pre myope and has all the risk factors for going into myopia control measures have to be instituted now talking about this what is this change in emetropization or what is this range of change in emetropization that we are talking about so all children from the hyperopic zone have to go into an emetropic zone right so there is this clear c l e e r e clear study that's been done so in which they have seen that on your uh, retinoscopy the horizontal meridian of refraction moves from a mean of 0.64 diopters at 6 years to a 0.28 diopters at 14 years the vertical meridian moves from a 0.58 at 6 years to a 0.33 at 14 years this is how on a mean or an average the uh, refraction proceeds so this study has been done with over 50000 subjects for over 10 years from 6 to 14 years of age so after that they have given this value as mean value now the presumed emetrop you have an emetropic child and if this child is losing more than or equal to 0.5 diopters of age normal hyperopia in a year then this child is going into premyopic zone so Uh, before the onset just one year prior to onset of myopia this uh, loss of uh, no age normal hyperopic power is very fast that is what they say so whenever you see a child with risk factors you follow them very closely to see if every year they are losing uh, plus 0.5 or more of the age normal plus power that they are supposed to have and next coming to age of onset the younger a child becomes myopic the faster that they will progress so in children 7 uh, years of age uh, they progress at least by one diopter and uh, by 11 or 12 if they start having myopia then this is actually half so most of the time they say that under 9 years if a child becomes myopic then uh, their risk of progressing is much higher coming to binocular vision in binocular vision and myopia we have a lot of uh, factors which are indicative of uh, progression and of onset as well one such indicator is positive relative accommodation so positive relative accommodation is just the measure of the maximum ability of that eye to stimulate accommodation while maintaining a clear and a single binocular vision meaning how much amount of accommodation that the eye can stimulate and maintain without going into accommodative convergence so pra is a very strong and single uh, predictor of myopia onset children or pre with pre myopia or who are uh, going into myopia these children have a significantly lower positive relative accommodation than uh, non myopes other associated binocular vision anomalies are higher ac by a ratios and esophorias right now even uh, veena madam mentioned that we see a lot of uh, moderate myopes with esophoria so this ac by a ratio and esophoria these are very very uh, significant indicators which say that this child is going to progress faster the increase of myopia uh, within one year is over 20 times if you see a child with esophoria and especially this esophoria and myopia it uh, comes only at the onset of myopia however ac by a ratio sometimes may be increased even four years prior to the onset however the peak uh, ac by a ratio is at the year of onset of myopia and from there if it exists if it's untreated or unintervened then it uh, definitely um, increases the progression of myopia as well accommodative lag again accommodative lag is seen only after the myopia onset is there so we don't know if it is a risk factor or it occurs because myopia has come and then uh, there is an accommodative lag IHT again has been associated with onset of myopia. Fifty percent of children with IHT are myopic by age ten, and ninety percent by twenty years of age. However, we don't know that if you correct IHT, will myopia not progress? That we are not sure. The association is, however, there. Genetics 
this we've known for years together and if a parent has myopia then the child might also be myopic so what is the risk exactly if one parent is myopic there's a two time risk of the child being myopic if both parents it just doubles and triples there's a five to six times risk that the children will be myopic over 150 gene loci have been associated with myopia there are a lot of variants however none of these variants are associated with near work or outdoor times only five variants have uh, shown apparent interaction with near work. And the most useful clinical indicator of genetic risk or parental history correlates directly to axial length in a child. Environment. Uh, environment, again, this has been pinned as the most important factor uh, for myopic progression and onset of myopia. So we know that myopia and near work have uh, come in with a lot of controversies, but they've all, wherever myopia is, near work is also there. So we can't just rule out uh, near work. Even in those days when we had no evidence, we still blamed near work for myopia. So near work at less than 20 centimeter working distance and durations of longer than 45 minutes have been linked with more myopic progression, especially this combination of more than three hours of near work in one day and reduced outdoor times, less than 90 minutes of outdoor time increases myopic progression on onset by 2.6 times. And why this uh, reduced outdoor time increases myopia is that they um, give a theory of uh, light. This light theory says that light towards the UV end of the spectrum has a tendency to slow the eye growth. It causes dopamine release in the eye and that in turn helps to reduce axial length or the growth of the eyeball is reduced and myopic progression is in turn reduced. That is what is proposed. Also the dioptric field of view, meaning indoors uh, the dioptric field of view is, uh, is highly variable or is higher. Whereas when you go outdoors, this difference in defocus or the blur that an outdoor in induces is almost uniform. So the defocus area is almost uniform. There's no large jump in focus and defocus in viewing distances in outdoor. So that does not stimulate a lot of eye growth. And that is why outdoor uh, reduces myopic progression. So more uh, outdoor time not only reduces progression, but also red, uh, prevents onset of myopia in children. And um, this might be one of the reasons why um, now the people are a little reluctant to give blue blockers because they think this visible light, UV end and all that blue blockers may actually be, uh, blue light may actually be helpful in controlling myopic progression and children don't need blue blockers. If you stop blue light, maybe myopia might progress. That is one school of thought that's going on. They have uh, evidence depending on this only. Uh, so that is why many of them are uh, refraining from uh, giving blue blockers right now. The other factors, if you look at female gender is a risk factor in every other study, they say females are more prone, females are more prone. There's an interesting uh, study which has come out in relation to it, which I will be mentioning. And rural to urban, again, in urban, uh, 2.6 times a higher risk of myopia may be uh, associated with the less outdoor time, more uh, uh, academic uh, push and all that. And winter times, it progresses uh, three to four times faster. So in colder areas, they say the myopic progression is three to four times faster, maybe associated with the level of lights as well. This is what I mentioned, the age at Menaki. There is a study which was done in the Korean National Health and Nutrition Examination from 2008 to 2012, where they said the age at Menarche is inversely associated with the severity of myopia. So they almost took a sample size of uh, 8,500 odd girls uh, up to 14, 19 years of age. So they said that the older age of menarche decreases the risk of uh, moderate and high myopia progression. Uh, they uh, propose that maybe the hormones associated uh, with puberty and everything may be causing this high myopia or the progression into myopia. So this study has a significant sample size and um, a good multinominal regression and everything. However, the limitations being a cross-sectional design and lack of causality assessment is there. Um, just because female gender has been uh, more prone, I just picked out the study because uh, it, it, it was published in recent times. Next, coming to birth order, this is also kind of an interesting study where they said the firstborns have a 10% more likely chance to be myopic or high myopic as compared to the next siblings. So this study almost took in 90,000 subjects and uh, compared between the firstborn and the secondborn sibling. A lot of studies say the firstborn is more prone and all that. Uh, this study, the difference was that uh, they had adjusted for education as well. The education and academic uh, 
achievement and then they saw how much uh, progression was there the odds ratio was definitely increased but uh, they uh, said that once the education uh, was corrected the level of education was corrected uh, the myopic progression risk went down by 25% so maybe this is because the first sibling uh, or the first child has a lot of parental pressure for, to perform or to be academically better maybe that is why these children show more myopic progression now this is a schematic um, uh, picture to show how myopia progresses so when the onset is less than 9 years they are more likely to progress faster when there is a myopic parent less than uh, 90 minutes of outdoor time more than 2 hours per day of close work associated with binocular vision anomalies like esophoria lag or a higher ac by a now all these risk factors when the child has to go through all of them uh, they reach the level of high myopia well before so the risk assessment uh, tabulated for uh, developing myopia less than 9 years when they develop myopia the onset is also higher one parent uh, being myopic again the onset and progression is uh, higher east asian ethnicity they, they are more prone time spent outdoors less than 90 minutes it is a risk more than uh, 2.5 hours a day for near work is increased risk so increased risk of onset when there's parental myopia ethnicity refractive error near work and limited outdoor time for progression again age refractive error the spherical equivalent at which they present the ethnicity and parental myopia so how do we prevent all this so the main thing which which comes in when there is lifestyle modification is to increase outdoor activity now most schools in singapore taiwan and other uh, china and all that they have made policies which say that the children should at least have uh, 90 minutes of outdoor time in school itself so taiwan has a public health program saying daily 120 where at least 2 to 3 days per day is suggested and the light exposures when you go outdoors is up to 1000 to 3000 lux when you stay indoors it's only up to 350 lux that is why they say that outdoor light is way better and even if the child is staying indoor you need adequate ambient lighting bright lights may be protective for these children uh, the level of luminance should always be a little higher and you have all these gadgets like fitsight smart watch which is going to record how much of outdoor time the children have uh, spent and it will send a through a sensor and it will send a feedback to parents as well as children so that they can monitor uh, so increase 76 minutes per day reduces myopia by 50% One hour per day or seven hours per week. I'm sorry, this is not day. It's seven hours per week. Forty-five percent reduction in myopia. So the outdoor time of at least two hours per day will have the greatest effect on delaying or preventing myopia onset. And I did added bonus to this outdoor uh, play is that children are seen to have a reduced BMI and also sedentary lifestyle has reduced. so now that our classrooms previously were well illuminated you would have seen government school classrooms with large windows and all that but today in modern posh schools all this system we have smart classes with very very reduced illumination and all that maybe the system has to change and we have to go back to well illuminated large classrooms again with uh, a good amount of pt period so that uh, myopia progression comes down reduce near work continuous reading of more than 30 to 45 minutes Uh, uh, increases the risk the type of near work close reading distance decrease brightness all this are detrimental and will be um uh, giving up uh, increased myopic progression though uh, there are controversial evidences near work is not good and uh, is causing a progression of myopia as what we know for now there are anti myopia pens which are common in china now so when the child goes very close to the book or to the reading material the pen gives off uh, feedback so that the child comes back to a a uh, safe distance in the 2020 20 rule this is very common all of us have been using it since the covid pandemic you take a break if if you are using near work or screen time for longer uh, periods take a break for 20 seconds look at something 20 feet away for every 20 minutes to maintain good visual hygiene in addition to this good food good sleep is also recommended because a healthy child will also have a good vision performance meaning the strain on the eye reduces and all this bv anomalies and everything come down so that also is recommended now for children o optical intervention again inducing a myopic defocus or plus lens in children now for this we really don't have sufficient evidence should we start treating pre myopes 
if we treat pre myops will myopia not come uh, the onset will be prevented or will it prevent progression we still do not know we do not have substantial evidence stating that it will delay onset but maybe if in some time maybe th this can also be tried so if you have a pre myopic child who has a strong uh, risk factor profile maybe uh, starting on peripheral defocus lenses or uh, low dose atropin may be tried but we don't have uh, clear evidence atropin therapy also the efficacy it has rebound effect and the efficacy of atropin is lower when uh, there are prolonged near activities in free screen time so without lifestyle modification none of your other thing is also going to work as much as you want them to so now we have the atom 3 trial which is investigating the prevention of onset in pre myops and control of myopia they have taken 5 to 9 year olds with at least one parent of minus 3 diopters myopia spherical equivalent of the child between plus 1 to plus 1.5 diopters astigmatism not more than 1.5d or uh, almost 600 participants atropin 0.01 percent versus a placebo and it is over a two year period so maybe when the results are uh, there then we can uh, decide as to whether to start treating pre myops or not and this has already been mentioned by vijima now that violet lenses uh, may have a role in reduction of uh, axial length and pre preventing myopia uh, there are also these acupressure points and eye exercises and all that uh, they say it relieves ocular fatigue peak systolic velocity in the central retinal artery it has shown to decrease accommodative lag however we have no conclusive studies but this is also going on on one side again with all this said and done uh, saying that myopia is a pandemic myopia is an epidemic and all that uh, just food for thought and going out of the league of myopia is a monster are we actually fighting the inevitable is myopia part of just evolution there is an adaptive myopia hypothesis which says that myopia in a normal environment in a normal environment where from a hunter gatherer lifestyle we are moving into modern civilization maybe myopia is a part of evolution itself maybe because we need near work more we are being pushed into this so i'll just leave you with this uh, thought here and thank you for the opportunity uh, and it's been wonderful sharing this session with uh, pv madam and in the presence of such eminent panel thank you <coughs> okay. Sahitya yes. just wanted to share, like we have an unpublished data of sibling study who had refractive errors. Almost 40% of the siblings had refractive error. Just wanted uh, to uh, Not 100%, yes, not everybody. Only 40%. 40%, mm. madam, but it's uh, over eight years back done. So now we are planning to do it again. Uh, um, Madam Inakshi here and uh, we are doing, it is uh, once again, uh, those who have come, it is about coming to 45% uh, uh, children are having the refractive error. And one interesting finding we just uh, found was if it is uh, both siblings are of the same sex, like both uh, uh, girls or both boys, the incidence is slightly higher the other child having the refractive error that is uh, more statistically significant than when it is one brother and sister. As both sisters or both brothers, the refractive error is uh, higher, but the number is still uh, yeah, only around uh, uh, 800 uh, children. When we have more data, we will be we are doing that project now, madam, the sibling screening project. So, more yes. data, we will get more clear picture. Uh, thank you, Sahitya, for bringing that uh, pre myopia into this thing. A lot of us uh, see a lot of cases. Whether to prescribe uh, any of these uh, interventions or not is a million dollar question. And uh, maybe we should go back to the Gurukulam style also, where a lot of uh, glasses used to be in, uh, um, under the tree, under the listing, under nature. Uh, but definitely we have seen an uh, increase in the COVID myopia because of the uh, near vision. Uh, and that too with small screens, all of them were with uh, smartphones. That is why it was another increase compared to the laptops because everybody could afford a smartphone for 6,000 or 5,000, so all the classes were done. Want to add anything? Uh, 
Nina? Oh, Dr. Nina, Madam. I think she's. Oh, but, uh, today's concern is uh, the rise in the myopia in refractive errors in children. It's really a concern. And after all the school screening programs or the college screening programs, now much focus is on their classes. And uh, there is resistance, like uh, not uh, teachers are also not much eager to uh, get these children treated like how it was before uh, pre-COVID era, there was eagerness. But now much focus is on uh, their curriculum, uh, their teaching, their exams and catching up with uh, what they lost out on the past two years. So that is a real concern, I feel. Yes, ma'am. The COVID boom actually it uh, added to one thing: increase near work and uh, market reduction in outdoor time, combined with uh, online classes, digital screen time. So maybe that is why uh, we've seen a uh, increase in myopia as well as BV anomalies as well. Binocular vision anomalies have also been on the rise post COVID. We don't have a control on that, Mina. We don't have a direct control on that. Yeah. <laughs> we can the measures where we can control, we can do yeah. something. <laughs> and madam, nowadays, uh, parents also start giving, giving the smartphone even at six months of age. They tell that uh, the child eats only after uh, seeing yes. some video on that. It's a common practice. It's yes. a very common practice. Yes. <laughs> how, how, how to go about it? It's a public health issue. <laughs> so we have to, we have to uh, maybe, I don't know, there are a lot of things to be done. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. Ma'am, uh, uh, ma I'm just uh, remembering one personal incident. When our son uh, Prasanna had to wear his glasses, at the age of four, you remember I was so upset and I was, uh, though as an ophthalmologist, I was so much upset and you opened your cupboard and took a frame and you said, I got this when I traveled abroad and your son is looking like Ajit uh, in this frame. <laughs> uh, don't worry about uh, this, uh, this thing, your son will study well and all that. You were consoling me a lot. So the spectacle in uh, younger age group, even among educated uh, people like us also, it, it, we take it, uh, I yes. took it a little uh, hard to uh, digest <laughs> and uh, you were really uh, uh, counselling me and uh, consoling me about it. Thank you. You gave the first <laughs> frame what uh, Prasanna started wearing. <laughs> first, uh, first frame. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, just a word on outdoor, uh, uh, asking the children to be outdoor. Uh, there was a study from L.V. Prasad which said that uh, not every outdoor place is a good place. There might be tall buildings if you, uh, if you ask the children to stay outdoor there, the level of exposure to the uh, ambient light is going to be less. So it's very important to qualify or quantify what type of outdoor activity is best. There was a study in which they studied uh, uh, in a building facing east, building facing north, etc., like under a tree. And they found out that it was better if there was more sun exposure rather than uh, staying outdoors and in between tall buildings where the sun exposure or the exposure to the light would be less. Yes, good point. Yeah. Then... Madam, would you recommend starting uh, atropine uh, early? If the both the parents are myopic, suppose no, you think the child comes the child and, developing the error. Without the child developing the error. No, no, madam. There is a refractive error. He's come to us at the point seven five or one diopters here at minus one diopters, but both parents are myopic. Even before it shows any progress, can we start? I I think I think there is no harm in starting. It's only 0.01%. And now that uh, drops, you know, atropine drops may have side effects, I mean, actually. This mm -hmm. is a problem. 0 0.01 no. may not have, but the daily use of drops. And then uh, uh, because instead of that, now we have all these defocus lenses now that you can yes. recover. Atropine, I think, uh, in my to my knowledge, it will slowly uh, go away from the uh, usage. Oh. So, uh, with the okay. lenses. 
uh, atropine for myopia i mean okay. with, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. with the invent oh. of the lenses oh. new lenses uh, okay. that may not to be uh, playing a greater role mm-hmm. but this modification you no know, that is much better the in of using daily drops and a 6 year old or 7 year old boy to answer uh, madam's question there are children where uh, we have been following them for quite some time they were earlier hypermetropic and subsequently they would, uh, become myopic so in these children even if they are uh, 0.5 say the refraction was physiological earlier and it was plus 1 and now the child has become 0.5 minus then in these cases i will be interested in starting the uh, any intervention be it atropine my first choice still remains atropine and maybe the other glasses in, in down the line However, if you have a child who is coming to you for the first time, the parents are myope and you are documenting 0.5 uh, refractive error of myopia, without documenting a progression, I wouldn't be keen on starting any method. And uh, of late, I have been start, I mean, not of late, uh, over the past four or five years, ever since a patient is, once the patient is detected myopic, I do a baseline axial length documentation. It becomes useful later on. rather than planning the axial log uh, documentation at a stage where you are planning atropine or dims lenses so my suggestion will be to do axial and documentation and keratometry at baseline once you detect myopia so that it becomes easier for you down the line that's uh, any more questions okay they will start with this Uh, no, there is nothing in the chat box, ma'am. Uh, okay, then uh, we come to the close of the session. Now, I request our president elect uh, Dr. Nirmal to say a few words about Dr. Nirmal. Dr. Nirmal, you are there. Yeah. Okay. And I think, yeah, you can. I think what what I think. Yes, sir. So uh, was an amazing uh, uh, beginning session for the new team. Uh, heartfelt thanks uh, to our masters for the day, uh, Vijayalakshmi Madam and uh, uh, Dr. Sahitya for this amazing session. Uh, thanks to uh, <clears throat> our panelists, uh, Veena Madam, Ram Prakash Sir, and uh, Meena Madam. and a special thanks to uh, meenakshi madam for uh, having uh, coordinated this event and uh, uh, the pillar of uh, this tnoi for now ramakrishnan sir for having organized uh, this amazing meeting uh, i was uh, following in youtube as to number of people who were actually viewing it the viewership was very good and uh, it stayed almost continuous for uh, uh, one and a half to two hours Uh, so uh, i think it has uh, got good viewership and we will get more viewers once this is put up in youtube uh, thanks to our uh, vice president uh, uh, nirmal sir uh, uh, vice this president elect and uh, president elect uh, nirmal sir and uh, satyan sir for having stayed throughout the program thanks to saravanan sir prasanna uh, ram prakash sir and uh, thanks to our uh, sponsors zivira for having sponsored this session and uh, to uh, Uh, Mrs. Manjula and uh, Mr. Uh, Sai Numerotic uh, for having coordinated the session. Thank you so much. Eagerly looking forward to the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Sai. Thank you. 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 Thank you.